are such an asshole. So, oh, I'm way out. Let's get this a little bit more regular. I um I was not looking forward to this one because I had economics and I thought I had left it all behind. Print off as much money as you want and tax the rich. Yeah, do whatever you want. Okay, I'm popular now. Uh, yeah, approve all those bank loans. And if I had just done that when I was younger, I'd make a lot more money and have a lot more money today. But uh, Mark wrote in and uh, he wants me to dust off my economics boots. I would like to pay for a video request. Watch this 14-minute video by the uneducated economist describing the Cantillion effect. You girls just control yourselves now, all right? You just you just sit there and control yourselves. <clears throat> Got an economist. I'm going to – I, previous economist, going to review another economist, uneducated or not, his opinion on the Cantillion effect and as it has an effect on inflation. You girls just control yourselves and sit the F down. Uh, so I went to his website, the YouTube channel. I linked to the video below. And the first thing I noticed, I'm like, is he in a Chevy Silverado? Because I'm using a truck. It looks awfully familiar to my 2003 Chevy Silverado. And then you look at um, some of the videos. One of the videos he has there is how to achieve wealth by driving a POS car. I'm like, hello. Okay. So let me, so it's linked below. You can listen to it. And I won't lie, guys. I had a hard time <clears throat> kind of digesting and figuring out what, not necessarily his overall point was, but the point is try to connect with the cotillion effect and inflation and poverty. And that's the subtopic of the, um, of his, of his uh, video here, economic failure, inequality, or poverty. So I took some notes. I'm going to try and do this justice. <clears throat> and um, I mean, you can walk away from it all here, maybe a little bit different viewpoint or, or clarity. So his main thesis is this thing called the Cantillian effect and its effect on inflation and poverty. And the way he, uh, well, how do we want to do it? <clears throat> the Cantillian effect, is, it's the fact that when you print off money, those who spend it for, who get the money first are the ones who benefit the most, obviously, because they're buying at normal weight or normal prices. And then as the money flows throughout the economy and permeates and circulates within the economy, prices go up. And then each successive purchaser uh, who gets that money uh, faces a higher and higher inflation rate until there effectively is no purchasing power. You just add inflation. And so those who are closest to the money printer uh, are the ones logically to uh, benefit the most in terms of purchasing power. Now, he went on, and he probably researched the Cantillion effect more than I did, but he went on, and his general thesis is this. All right. He uses the example of a silver mine because this was written, the Cantillion effect was written in ye olden days. So there's a mine in a town, a country, a state, whatever. And the people who mine the silver, they hit a mine, they hit a vein. So they get all this silver. Now they could go into the local economy and start buying up things. Now, if this economy is closed and there's no international trade, nothing really changed to increase the wealth and productive capacity of that closed economy. All you really did was cause inflation. Now, because <clears throat> silver is the is the currency, and you're effectively as a silver miner in charge of the printing presses, well, that makes you you could always buy at previously established prices. And then the inflation will hit you last, or I mean, will hit you the first round after the first round. But you get a you get a purchasing power advantage in, in being able to print off the silver. And then what he says is, all right, so all this silver now is coming into this local economy. But if it's not a closed economy and there's international trade, that is going to entice foreigners. Doesn't mean that you're from a foreign country, it could be state over, county over, city over, whatever, or actual foreign country. I'm going to use that because he then goes on in the international currencies. But you will attract a foreign, uh, foreign producers to come into your domestic economy and start providing goods and services. All right, so you, you mined out 10,000 more ounces of silver. And Japan says, oh, look at all that silver they got in the U.S. We want to sell our cars there too. He then goes on to say that with the entrance of foreign producers it eliminates the domestic ones hold on <clears throat> he 
And so when you eliminate the domestic ones and so you've eliminated your domestic productive capacity, you've eliminated the poor and the working class and the middle class. So now your economy really don't have an economy. It's just the people mining the silver, paying the foreigners directly to provide their goods and services. And so right now, the poor, as, as he uses it, I would say the non-miners, the non-money printers and the foreigners are the only people now benefiting from this economy. So if the money printing or the silver mining goes away, there's absolutely nothing at all, not even the rich class. And the foreigners say, you ain't got no more silver? We're going home and we ain't selling you no more Japanese cars. Now, <clears throat> there are three problems I have. And then, sorry, to conclude his thesis, therefore, money printing causes inflation and or economic inequality not to mention cripples your domestic production <laughs> and GDP. And so I have three main problems uh, with this application. I'm, I'm not saying they can't use the wrong tool to analyze this uh, because I just disagree with the, the presumption. The main uh, disagreement I have with this is that <clears throat> foreigners coming in, foreign producers, somehow eliminates the pr domestic producers. When I would argue, as you see in reality, particularly using the Japanese auto manufacturers, the U.S. auto manufacturers, if we print off more money or mine more silver, there is an increase in demand for all things, and all foreign producers are doing is meeting that excess demand. And if there is enough, now there may be a trade imbalance, we're not going to analyze that, but if there's enough new goods and services being flooded into this market by foreign producers, Technically, your inflation would not change if the right, you know, if we mined 200% more silver, but we got 200% more cars, well, then the average pr uh, price per car would roughly be the same. So I'd argue that your the existence or introduction of foreign competitors, unless there's a wage advantage, which China does have, but I'm not going to, I'm going to ignore that now, does not necessarily wipe out your domestic production either. It runs it helps meet the shortage uh, of uh, there's a shortage of supply. There's an increased demand. The domestic producers in the short term cannot meet that demand. Foreigners come in to meet that extra demand. Now, over time, <clears throat> yeah, they'll compete. And yeah, maybe the domestic people could out edge the, the foreigners or maybe the foreigners as Japan did with superior cars. Uh, China does with practically everything. Uh, you could squeeze out your manufactured domestic kind, but I don't, I don't want to analyze it that much. I'm just saying that's where I find one flaw that just because there's a foreign producer selling their wares in your economy does not now eliminate your domestic production and your domestic economy. And now it's just rich miners trading, uh, dollars or silver with foreign producers. Uh, so I don't think that people are unemployed necessarily. Um, heck Hey, you think Nissan's got, you know, Toyota, Nissan, I think all the major Japanese manufacturers have uh, uh, factories here, but he didn't talk about employment or, or uh, GDP. Uh, so that was my my main and first complaint or disagreement <clears throat> with us. Like, you're not going to eliminate your domestic uh, producers. Uh, second, uh, this is not even a disagreement or, uh, but it, it it's further lessens the application it's it's less analogous to the modern day world because where he says oh okay it's the miners the people who print off money obviously the government or rich people and it's just the rich and then the poor who are just sol i guess in this uh in pretty much every modern western economy the poor are the disproportionate re receivers of any kind of government money whether that's outright welfare whether it's funded through borrowing whether it's funded through money printing or whether it's actually funded through taxation. <clears throat> so in this particular instance, where to apply to today, you would say, oh, well, it's the poor that are going, it's only going to be the poor buying goods and services from foreigners. And then the rich would presumably have savings by which they could continue to buy. But I think this is even too short-sighted of an analogy because it, in my opinion, it doesn't matter if rich or poor, skinny or fat, tall or short. It doesn't matter who gets the money that first round. Yes, they're going to have an initial purchasing power advantage over others. And that initial round of spending 
will, you know, they'll benefit from that. But after the short term, uh, short term into the medium and certainly the long term, once that money permeates and, and circulates throughout the economy, all people within that economy are going to face higher prices and therefore lower standards of living. <clears throat> and so a perfect example of this, and I know I'm going to sound like a vicious dick, but I don't care. It's asshole consulting, not nice guy. So you saw this happen in the U.S. economy. They were, do you remember this guy called Barack Hussein Obama? Mm, mm, mm. And the little kids who are now full grown adults were taught to sing songs about him. And basically, he was elected on the backs of younger people back then, which were the millennials. And what did they want? They wanted what everyone wants free crap. Now, there was much more to it than that. Uh, and in fairness to President Obama, he was facing a, a financial crisis as well. But he increased the money supply by 386%. Just shy of 400%, depending on which measure of money supply you want to use. But he definitely increased the money supply multifold. And and not to mention dealing with a financial crisis, but a lot of money went to various social programs so people could have what? Free shit! And those same people who disproportionately voted for Obama mm, 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 are now complaining. Oh, by the way, and in addition to the extra money, we lowered interest rates a lot. And that was during Trump, too. Oh, and by the way, Trump did the same thing. So don't just think this is a slam on Democrats. Uh, Trump did the same darn thing. He took Obama's squad, almost quadrupling and tripled it on top of that. What? So you have more money in there. You have artificially low uh, interest rates, particularly as it pays to uh, place to 30-year mortgages, which aren't directly affected by the central banking rate, but we're not going to go into that. And these people who have voted for free money and give me that are now wondering, why is housing so expensive? Well, there's inflation. And everyone faces that, rich or poor. Why, why is now, why is gas so expensive? There's supply chain. But every, you know, it's the inflation everywhere. Yeah, everyone faces these costs. And so <clears throat> the cotillion effect, certainly in the short term or that initial round of money printing and consequential spending, sure, that's a fascinating thing. But the more permanent effect that we should be worried about is like, what happens to prices? Well, prices go up for everyone and everything. Um, and so I, how would I put it? Inflation, the thesis, if we go to the title, let me make sure it's economic failure, inequality, or poverty. Um, I'm going to say it's going to be poverty for everyone, or at least a lower standard, not poverty for everyone, but a lower standard of living for everyone. Because any time, no matter what machinations are in, it doesn't matter. Any time you print off more money than the amount of stuff you produced, there will be inflation. And at minimum, your savings will have less purchasing power and therefore you will suffer a lower standard of living. And unless you are uh, in a job or have a wage that goes up with inflation, which not everybody does, now your income also suffers. <clears throat> so, it will be increased poverty. With poverty is too strong a word. It will be lower standards of living for all. It will be especially uh, felt upon the poor, because I mean, I remember being poor. I remember when gas was like I think it was two thousand four. Gas was was four dollars a gallon back then. Oh, that hurt. I remember five dollar footlongs. That was my new Jesus Christ. That was so wonderful. They're beautiful. All that food for five bucks. So uh, there's that. Then the inequality <clears throat> that inflation is rarely universally distributed, uh, especially depending on how it flows through the economy, especially like, for example, housing has a disproportionate, uh, uh, has experienced a disproportionate amount of inflation because banks pool the money and lend it out to make these purchases. Cars as well. Um, anytime where you're using money borrowed from the banks where it kind of magnifies and pulls it together to buy these purchases, anything like that, student loans, medical bills, right? If you got to pay cash for it, like bubble gum, bubble gum ain't going to go that much up in price. But if you can lend money against it at low interest rates, you're flooding that market in the economy. So um, inequality, that depends on that particular economy at that particular time and how the money flew, flowed through it. I'd say generally like eight out of 10 times it's going to affect the poor worse. It's going to worsen inequality, but sometimes not. And also, let's also consider this. If you had a fine, you have this big buildup in, in money and inflation that comes crashing down. Uh, that's good 
for you want to crash you want crashing asset prices you want uh, deflation so that you could buy in the S&P 500 tuition is cheaper but more importantly housing but with housing going up generally speaking because of the nature of our our lending system your fixed assets particularly housing the number one expense in someone's budget is going to go up consequently rents will also go up because they just follow the housing market so it's disproportionately going to affect the poor but not necessarily always so <clears throat> splitting hairs but are you girls wet yet let me know if you're wet yet just calm down <clears throat> splitting hairs i would say increase lower standards of living and generally increases inequality generally but that would be inflation in general all right then he has a second concern and he doesn't come out and explicitly state this but it's kind of more implied and he's got a concern about the world reserve currency because in the analogy he's using it's using silver. Well, silver has intrinsic value. Yes, it could fluctuate and you could flood the market like the Spanish did with gold back in the, whenever they were doing their thing in the 1500s. Ignore all that. <clears throat> um, silver has intrinsic value, right? Fiat currency, which is what the US dollar does not. And right now though, as he rightly points out, the US dollar only has quasi intrinsic value because it's the world's reserve currency. And then he brings up, you know, very real concerns and points about the United States dollar as a viable continuing world reserves currency. Because in the case <clears throat> that the U.S. dollar were to no longer be that silver, foreigners are always going to want that. Oh, you got silver? You got the gold? Let me make you some Japanese um, uh, cars. But if the dollar were to lose value and no longer have the world's reserve currency, there's, the demand for U.S. dollars is not going to be that high. I said, well, we don't want those dollars. That's funny money. You were the world's reserve currency. Now your, your dollar is only worth one-tenth of what it is now. In the olden days, that would get you 100 yen. Now it only buys 10 yen, and we can't sell a car for 10 yen you know, per dollar. So, well, before I get ahead of myself, um, whereas silver would maintain its value, the dollar or any world reserve currency, not necessarily so. And so his concerns are, are absolutely correct and fundamental. The U.S. has the most amount of debt. We have the most amount of outstanding obligations. We have, well, we have inflation. We have, he doesn't mention this, we have slowing GDP growth rate. We have dwindling uh, labor force production or labor force participation rates. Um, what else? Just our, our fundamentals, your fundamentals of a currency are not good for the United States. But he makes a slight mistake, but it's an important mistake where he says, we have the most. Yes, you're right. We do have the most, not relative to GDP. And since a currency is an affair or a relation or, or the byproduct of an individual country's GDP and the amount of currency that it is printed or circulated, you can't just take a nominal, like for example, the Swiss franc, I'd have to look it up more recently, but it's stronger than the U.S. dollar. Well, but they don't have anywhere near the GDP. Yeah, but relative to the GDP that they do produce, the Swiss franc has a fair amount of purchasing power. Um, what you have to do is look at the fundamentals of these nations in terms of you know, the size of their economy and what the productive capacity is. And when you do that, <clears throat> we've talked about this before, where some people call it the last horse in the glue factory, the hottest fat chick at a party of fat chicks. Or the smartest kid on the short bus. Our fundamentals in the United States are horrible. They are absolutely horrible. And this is why I'm somewhat sympathetic towards um, gold guy, Peter Schiff. He was right. He was absolutely right. He just undercounted the, the world's reserve currency effect and the fact that any country out there that would give the United States a run for its money in terms of world reserve currency is worse than us. Japan has higher debt to GDP ratios. China has higher debt to GDP ratios. Russia, not so much. Russia's act, I'd have to again look it up more recently. <laughs> Their fundamentals are better, but they're in the middle of a freaking war. And I would also argue Russia does not have anywhere near the productive reserves, genuine GDP growth to give its otherwise fiat currency value. So there's also an issue of size. China would be a good, a good potential. Juan would be a good potential debunker they talk about the BRICS, india uh, but the problem with china india and russia and brazil if you throw in b for the BRICS, they're all way more corrupt than the united states so and 
the European Union as a general economic zone, that's an, another alternative, the euro, not every country, but most of their countries as a group have worse fundamentals than the United States. The United States prints off 10% more money. Everybody else prints off 12% more money. Then you throw in corruption and there is no heir apparent. There is no obvious threat to the U.S. dollar as a world reserve currency. We are all fat chicks at a fat chick party, and the United States is the prettiest one of them. So, and I've, I've said this before, if China and Russia, whatever, not even adversaries, but rivals, I think would be, you know, we don't really hate each other that much. Well, maybe Russia and the United States do now, but China and America, like... And keep an eye on them. You know, you're not going to pick a fight necessarily. <clears throat> but if China wanted to beat the United States militarily, economically, however else, you would expunge corruption from your economy. You would go after that like, like a doctor does cancer. Unfortunately, the corruption is endemic to the CCP and you have a dictatorship, so that ain't going to happen. But if you really wanted to beat the United States become a more reliable and trustworthy government because if your government isn't reliable or trustworthy, you could just print off way more money or confiscate or do currency controls and not allow people to bank and all this other stuff. Oh, I don't know. Set up a social credit score system. Oh, yeah. Let, let's let have those guts trust that currency. Oh, yeah. All right. Um, <clears throat> so he is absolutely correct, though. Uh, and his concerns, but I don't think those concerns, as bad as it is, it is in the United States, I still don't think it's, I don't see a, a threat as of yet. Of course, I'd have to go to the OECD and brush up on my figures and data, but ain't nobody paid me to do that. So uh, I'm not going to do that. Um, now, that being said, his general theory is 100% correct. If the U.S. does lose the world reserve currency, um, What's going to end up happening is, well, I'll, I'll go through my notes of th three basic things, All right, First, all those dollars are going to come back home, not the very next day. But if the United States dollar is replaced by another currency as a world reserve currency, all that global demand to have contracts paid in the U.S. dollar for all the central banks to hold U.S. dollar, all these foreign countries holding U.S. dollars and dollar denominated assets, <clears throat> the dollar is going to drop like value. They're going to have all these dollars and say, what are we going to do with it? Well, without international demand for a dollar, every currency, every currency out there, the only place you could, where can you spend Mexican pesos? Mexico. Where can you spend Japanese yen? Japan. You can't go to Botswana with Japanese yen. Hey, do you take this? No, we don't. But you can go to Botswana probably with dollars. Hey, hey do you take this? Yeah, you sure hell we do. <clears throat> so there's this international demand. If that goes all the way, now they got all these dollars, what do they do with it? They're going to go to the only country they could spend it on. That's the United States. You say, great, booming demand. Like, okay, yeah, there might be some booming demand, but how many crappy Hollywood movies do foreigners want to buy? How many Fords do they want to buy? Admittedly, Chevy Silverado's are good vehicles. How much American crap do they want to buy? And this presumes we even have the labor force participation rates to create the crap that people want. And all I see here domestically we produce, we produce pretty good fighter jets. <clears throat> We, we used to produce good movies, pretty good technology, maybe some clothes, but the Italians beat us. And we got some cars, but I don't know. There, there's not enough stuff that foreigners demand that we produce. I don't know. You want a diversity and inclusion lecture? What do you, what do you want? What do you, we got, <laughs> you want a college degree for $200,000? Won't find you a job. <clears throat> but even if there were like, oh, wow, we, we want to buy a lot of American crap. Short term, the immediate productive capacity of the United States would not be able to meet that demand. And as all those dollars come in here, <clears throat> either to buy, well, that's one thing you would have to worry about, buying land. Now, China does that with Australia and, and Canada and some other countries. So there's like, well, we might as well buy your fixed assets. Companies would be acquired. I guess that would be one thing. American banks, American manufacturers, any company that has a profit is an actual valuable asset that would get bought up. <clears throat> Um, and in that case, maybe the foreigners would be the ones, to, but they need to still rely on domestic labor uh, to staff those companies. But that in initial flood of money coming in because no one else they can't use dollars anywhere else, you're going to have hyperinflation, depending on how many foreign uh, dollars are outside of U.S. borders that are coming back in. <clears throat> so there's your inflation where I talked about how now 
Yeah, they, they'd only buy up our productive assets. So, yeah, the poor is even screwed more. Uh, so there's that. Imports have become way more expensive. Why? Because there's no more demand for dollars, and that would be represented in a, uh, a rebalancing or a, a drop of the dollar's value against foreign currencies. So if the dollar loses purchasing power against the Japanese yen, a Honda ain't going to cost you $40,000 because in the past you could take that $40,000 and you go to the international exchange. <clears throat> you would exchange that $40,000 for 400,000 yen. That would be given to the Honda Motor Corporation. They say, okay, 400,000 yen. It only took us 325,000 yen to build that car and ship it over there. So we made 75,000 yen. And they're saying, well, your dollars don't get you 100 yen per dollar no more. Now it only gets you 10. Now you got to spend 400,000 US dollars to get back to the same 400,000 yen that it's profitable for. So all your import, oh, you think cell phones are expensive now. <laughs> you think cell phones are expensive now. I mean, all you like this thing, this this arm. Obviously, it's all made in China. I think this was twenty or thirty bucks. This would be. I mean, <clears throat> depends on how bad the U.S. dollar collapses. But if the U.S. dollar lost its world reserve currency status, this twenty-five dollar microphone boom would easily go for one hundred twenty-five, two hundred bucks. Now, did my salary go up? No. And so everything, I, the imports would just stop. You'd have shortages because the people were like, no, we ain't selling there no more. The dollars are, that's funny money. But like, but we have Lizzo. Would you like to hear a song from a fat, loud black woman? Huh? Here's Taylor Swift. If you like skinny white chicks, do you want to hear them sing? They're sad sappies. No, we don't. We will, however, buy your farmland. So Lizzo can eat more? Yes. <laughs> Shame. Shame. <clears throat> um, and then where it would, going back to the foreigners' introduction to the domestic market to capture increased money supply purchases, um, foreigners might close plants because the value of the currency just is no longer there to warrant. You just can't generate enough sales to cover your operating expenses running a company in the United States. And so that would lay off a lot of domestic people, probably some a handful of managerial people who are, say, Japanese natives that come to the United States to manage, but they'd probably go back home. Uh, and so you'd have, you'd have a real recession then on your hand, but there that would even cause more inflation because if you got rid of all your uh, foreign imports and Foreign companies producing in your borders. If that all, if you got all goods and services, like <clears throat> for example, you see all those um, storage bins over on the, the ports where they come off the big tanker ships and all that. What if? Well, we kind of saw that with uh, COVID, didn't we? Like, what if just nothing came into the country? Oh, what is in the country is going to sky through. If you can make anything, all of it. So you got all the money coming back in. Nothing is being produced by foreigners in your country and not being shipped to your country by foreigners. The amount of stuff in the economy. Oh, oh, it'd be horrible, horrible. So what it would, after this event, and this will, this will get back to, I, I don't, I, Try to make economics not complicated when I used to do economics. But it'll inevitably boil back down to after all the dollars come back into the U.S. economy, your domestic economy, and all the foreigners leave, either pull their investments out or they don't supply you anymore. You're back to the island. You're back to basic fundamentals of economics. And that is how much stuff do you produce and how much money do you have? And going forward, how much more stuff are you going to produce? And are you going to F with the money supply? And the answer is always yes, because we just can't. Crazy me. GDP went up 3%. All right, print off 3% more money. GDP contracted by 2%. Buy 2% money out and burn it. <clears throat> oh, but we got stable prices. Oh, no. And this is my final point of the whole thing. Cantillion effect or not. All of economics is what percent of your countrymen are going to get off their lazy asses, in the particular case of the United States, their fat lazy asses, and produce stuff people want. 
That's it. And if your politicians or central bankers are smart enough to leave the money supply the F alone, that's it. That's all economics is. It's not more complicated than running a lemonade stand store. And once you start effing with the money supply, now I'm all for global trade and all that, but that complicates it. But the fundamentals about your economy and your culture and your, your society doing well financially is work harder, work more, work smarter, and don't print off more money. So anyway, uh, check out his site. I am going to take a look at a couple. He does have some interesting, let me go to his, and this is not to besmirch him. I, I'm kind of curious about his background. If he's uneducated, is he trained by himself? Street level thoughts, opinions, analysis, perspectives from a working class point of view. He's on the front lines. He's working. He's thought about it. I still like the truck. Um, oh, he's doing carpentry. Teach him when they are young. Looks like he's teaching his kid. To, what are you putting in a window? You framing a window? Oh, you found us. Oh, man. I bet you he likes wheat pennies, too. He found a silver nickel. Yeah, this is no. It was it was a pretty good analysis. Obviously, I I abbreviated it. Uh, they want your your suffering in pain. We they want you in pain and misery. How they price gouge into inflation, economic crisis, a Nobel Prize winning economist is confused. Oh, dude, the Nobel Prize means nothing. I I almost guarantee it, this isn't a compliment to him. It's a slam on Nobel Prize winning economist. This guy knows more than. Nobel Prize winning economist because the Nobel Prize doesn't mean anything anymore, along with the Clark Medal. Uh, falling rents. Can you say thank you, capitalism? Where are rents falling? Uh, <clears throat> should be flight uh, bankruptcy. Yeah, take a look. Looks like he's, he has a quite an impressive. Looks like he's doing two or three a week. He's got a lot of videos. He's got a lot of videos. So. All right. So uh, I'll go to the Super Chats here in a second. Link below, though, by the way, is linked to his video he did. Also linked to my course, Achieving Financial Excellence. That's open for enrollment on Teachable. It always is. And then below that uh, is Bachelor Pad Economics, if you want to learn about more finance and investing than economics. All right, girls, you may attack us now. You may swarm us. All right, let's go to the Super Chats. Holy cow, look at the Super Chats. This made it worth it. <laughs> the guy who requested this did pay. I had to like listen to the video and take notes and like, okay, what is he saying? Uh, Athamel Decua, two bucks. Probably no doubt uh, Mexican poops. The goddamn bacon, who you guys could subscribe to over on YouTube for 223. Congrats on 100,000, Cappy. <clears throat> you, get a, you get a guy now. I applied for the, for the thing and... Um, they said I didn't have a hundred thousand, and I'm looking at my site. It says I have a hundred thousand. I'm like, I don't care. I just don't care. Y'all make it difficult. It just it's one of those things where you're saying, all right, it's gonna take me at least three hours to get this stupid plastic trinket, isn't it? You're gonna make this painful instead of just having a simple policy like, okay, you got a hundred thousand. What's your mailing address? Here you go. Dung is fun, five bucks. Cap, I used to be a devoted Christian, but now I'm coming around to the Muslim religion. Anybody that says anything negative will be a bigot. I I uh I appreciate your practical purposes, but do you actually believe the religion? That would be my question. So I'm agnostic. It's not, I have nothing against Christianity or Muslim or Islam, rather, or Judaism per se, but I gotta believe in it first before I'm gonna <clears throat> oh yeah, I'm 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 done with these people. Drew, two bucks, look at good, Cappy. The not drinking thing is working. You know what else works? Not being sick, not having Christmas, not having to drive across freaking Wisconsin to visit all your family members, and having two whole months to hit the mountains and hit the gym regularly. Also, no carbs. <clears throat> My truth, five bucks. A wise exer once ranted, you stop trying to change the world. Study STEM and do what society pays you to do. Economists got to keep econing. Professor Celery. Yep, it's very simple. Do what society wants you to do and charge them for it. Uh, Jertain behind the curtain, five Canadian bucks. In Canada, civil servants are guaranteed wage increases 4% above inflation. I am sure they'll work out wonderful for Canada. <clears throat> that is why Canada is the global dominant economic superpower it is. Sam Whiskey for 20 generous dollars with the most American name in America. 
100K is 100K. Congratulations, Clary. Uh, Clary. You got more subscribers thanks to Ascot Cappy. Yes, Ascot Cappy definitely put me across the line and not fresh and fit. <laughs> that was It wasn't fresh and fit or the immediate 800 subscribers I got after being on their show that night. Uh, X runner 55, 550. Cappy, your fattest chick on a fat chick theory is better than George Gammon saying dollar milkshake theory. You should tell him. I didn't even come up with that. I think that was turd flinging monkey that came up with it. I didn't come up with any of those. It was a gal that came up with horse in the glue factory. Maybe it was TFM that came up with smartest kid on the short bus, but I did not come up with fat chick at a fat chick party. So don't complain to me. Just lose weight. Sam Whiskey, dang, man, not a $10 again. Cappy, does the America dream keep you poor? Um, No, no, it, it doesn't because the America dream is a nuclear family with a house that's paid off. Nowhere does it say in the new, nowhere does it say in the Bible, nowhere does it say in the American dream that you need a brand new SUV and a German imported car for both wifey poo and hubby poo and then some kind of other all-terrain vehicle toy and your kids have to go to college for jokes of degrees at you know two hundred dollars a credit nor does it say that right now if you work a regular job and make your forty thousand dollar a year it's not going to be fancy i <clears throat> sadly because of all the money we printed off yeah maybe maybe the american dream is impossible because you're priced out of housing but hey you kids had some temporary relief for your student loan stuff right that's good that's great the American dream doesn't keep you poor. Keeping up with the Joneses keeps you poor. <clears throat> it's basically still continuing to live like it's middle school or high school is what keeps you poor. My truth, the king. You keep daring us that nobody paying you to econ and someone's going to pay you to do some econing. All that fiat returning home, if I'm understanding correctly, is the dollar milkshake theory effect. Brent Johnson. I'd have to. I'd have to watch George Gammon. I've talked to George a couple times. He's been on a couple shows. Uh, him and I together. Um, I'd have to find out what it is. But <clears throat> here's another thing for you guys to exercise and gnaw on with your your aspiring economic minds. Instead of thinking about international trade in the U.S. and all that, view the world, the globe. Instead of countries, just view them as states of the United States or provinces of Canada or whatever country. And it, it's all one country. All right. And just think, okay, my nation's currency, we just printed off all this money. What's that going to have an effect on the global economy? By definition, it's going to dilute the value of your money. That's it. And then whether it crosses borders and, and into your particular state or province, uh, what would that what would happen if you know only here's here's another way? Let's reverse it. What if all the money came back to Arkansas? All the dollars just went in the in the domestic economy. It just went to Arkansas. What would happen to Arkansas? Arkansians, Arkansasians, the people of Arkansas, they don't have the, the gross state productive ability to produce $30 trillion a year in GDP. <clears throat> Dung is fun. 10 bucks. Cappy, we invade a country for 20 years. They have no currency. But when we leave that country, we leave behind billions of dollars in our country. Are they going to use our currency? I think they will. They might. Yeah, they might. Oh, there's a lot of a lot of countries are pegged to the dollars, and a lot of countries use the dollar. I think El Salvador is one. Jertain behind the curtain, two twenty Canadian shutting down all beer plants too because electric vehicles. Good. I I I so don't care. I can fix things. I have solar panels. I have tools. I have no expensive tastes. I ha I don't care. I don't care. I'll miss eating out. I'll miss. But I think I'll still play poker with the guys. I'll still go hiking. I I know I'll miss driving on road trips, I guess, but I have a motorcycle, so I got really good fuel efficiency there. I won't miss much in my life because my life isn't about things or stuff. Dave, 128 for two bucks. But what about UBI? That will solve all the issues. We just need more money. The solution to inflation, I've done this. I've trolled people like, oh my God, whatever inflation. And it's some leftist thing. So I just say, we just need more money. We need to print off more money. But want to cause more inflation? And I'm like, no, no, not if it's spent in this particular sector and held within the banking. And I'm like, oh, okay. I just go for it now because I no longer cheer for Western people. I don't. 
I'm like, you're gluttonous, you're fat, you're lazy. I, I, yeah, get, get all the free surgeries you want, man. Here's the money. Free education. Waste 10 years studying your, studying your hole between your leg. You study that, man. That's great. You got a doctorate in that. I want you to write your books about all that crap that don't sell. I want you to make crappy movies that no one buys. I want you to make cars that no. I want you to waste your entire life doing nothing of value. Oh, and everyone be fat and act like they got attitude. You're in the most hottest, most beautiful thing ever. Keith Corate Cornelia, 11 Canadian bucks. Buy gold and not stupid cryptocurrency. Starve the system. I'm, I'm not against cryptocurrency. Why not have a little bit? It ain't going to hurt you. <clears throat> but yeah, and, and I'm I'm more of a silver guy than a gold guy. But that's just me. Love me them wheat pennies, though. Be strong, two bucks. Do you believe in karma? Uh, yeah, what? Be strong. Have you heard me a million times on karma? Karma is real because you say that guy's going to get it in the end, but it's not God or some divine being that executes justice and smites him. It's because you can't be a dick to the rest of society. And where karma comes in the most is when you turn into an adult. You're a little child. You treat all the other kids like crap, whether you're a bully or a bitch or whatever else. And you go out into the real world, and people don't tolerate that crap. No one wants to have anything to do with you. And so when you're the person, well, you think you're better than me? That's like, yeah. And that's why no one invests in you. Some of these people commit violence. They end up getting shot or they go to jail. That's karma because society doesn't tolerate pricks for long. I mean, they did shoot the school shooter, right? Tragic, but that person didn't last, right? <clears throat> uh, public news, it's five bucks. I'm in my mid-40s and over the past year have had more interest from women in their 20s than ever. How do you explain that? I don't know. You're confident. You don't care. You're, you're not flooding the market. I also have to imagine you're in good shape. Women are not going to express interest to you unless you're in good shape. A uh, fair amount of gals that I run into at various establishments I go to are very friendly to me. I don't know if they'd be hitting on me, but they're certainly more friendly to me than like when I was like a scrawny little twerp back in high school or, or middle school. Um, yeah, you must be. I'm assuming you're good looking. You're dressing up well. Um, Javier Berges, ARS 90, Printer Go Burr. What's an ARS? Argentinian? No. I usually can guess these. ARS to USD. ARL. Let me say Argentina. Albanian? Are they part of the Euro. Angola? ARS. Andorra? What do we got? Argentine pesos. I was right the first time. Why is there no P? Why is there an S? Oh, look at that. Argentina that just keeps printing off more money like it always do. Its currency is collapsing. <laughs> oh. Let me guess. The world community will bail them out a fourth time in as many decades. Public nuance. Nuisance. Two bucks. Where did the name Dog of No Real Value come from? Oh, so <clears throat> I was out working on the Southern Command, and I just started singing Dog of No Real Value. It's just... There's another song I came up with called I'm Gonna Love the Ivy Dog, Ivy Dog, Ivy Dog. I'm gonna love the Ivy Dog and give her lots of treats. So yeah, it's just I just came a dog with no real value song. And so then I just started calling her the dog of no real value. Be strong, five bucks. I've seen a lot of evil bosses get away with a lot and nothing ever happens to them. You don't, <clears throat> no, no, that's the thing. You don't see, you only see them at work. Think about what their life is like. Think about what their wife is like. If you are a prick to people at work, you are a prick to all people. You're also probably bad with money. You're probably bad with your health. I saw this with a lot of all the bank, not all, but the, it was the minority of bankers that were in shape. <clears throat> and you see them making money, I guarantee you they pissed it all away. I guarantee you can't, you can't see it. But like, I mean, if you want, go stalk them. I mean, don't stalk them. That'd be illegal. But Go find out what the, you know, maybe stalk them on the internet. Go look up your boss. Look up your boss. Find them on Facebook. You look, and keep in mind, Facebook is like the best face possible. But you find out. Oh, I see your wife is a little fat. Oh, I see your kids, you know, you're a dick and, and you're a dick to your kids and your kids won't talk to you. Imagine that. Your kids don't want to talk to you. 
Is that enough punishment for you? Is that enough karma? You don't see that. You just see a dickhead boss. We don't see is that his, his daughter hates him and, and runs off and gets pregnant and then has the baby boomer couple take care of the grandchildren. <laughs> it's more common than you think. All right. There you go. I will see you guys later. Toodles.